Good morning. It's good to see you. Glad that you have uh, chosen to gather with us. I'll be either in, here in person uh, or virtually with us uh, today. I'm, I'm glad that you're connected here at Cool Spring. That song, um, I don't know if it was like the Hammond organ background that caught my attention first. That's not normally in my uh, my playlist, but um, I'm listening to this and and of course I'm I'm quoting First Corinthians 13. I mean, just the love chapter. And, and I'm running through my mind um, as I'm listening to the song, this, the power of love and how significant it is. And when I, when I take a look at what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, you know, I can be right. You can be gifted. All the skills and abilities and talents You can have all the resources, but if you don't have love, it's nothing. And maybe it's the older that I get, the the more the realization of the power of love seems to come over me, and how significant that is. Because without love, there is no gospel. The gospel is love. For God so loved the world that what? He gave his one and only son. That whoever believes would not perish but have everlasting life. The gospel is the demonstration of God's love for you and for me. And as recipients of the gospel and as recipients of God's love, therefore we are are commissioned in a way that we are challenged, we are called. There's almost this compulsion that, that we too must love as ones that have received that love. And I realize that when I when I think about the ability to love, you know. There are people who are easy to love. Maybe they share DNA. Maybe that they share life with you. Maybe that you've been together long enough. In fact, guys, ladies, just turn to each other and say to your husband and wife, hey, just say, you're easy to love. Okay, just say it real quick. Just say, you're easy to love. We'll get that pass, okay, because the other two you don't want to be a part of. These two, this one you want, right? And then there's another group that... There's another group that we're challenged to know how to love because maybe we, we have no DNA, that we have no life experience, and it's all about discovery and trying to figure them out. And so we, we're kind of clueless in how to love someone. And then there's, there's that person that's difficult to love. Do you have somebody you struggle with loving right now? Do not turn to your wife or your husband and say that, right? Like you're going to need counseling. I've got a couple of people I'll send you to after the service. But, but there are people that are difficult to love. And, and you know what? I think all of us are difficult to love on some level. Because sometimes we make it difficult for people. And so this challenge of, of loving. And so... I realize that there's some spaces it's really easy, some spaces it's, it's kind of difficult to figure out, and others it's, it's a real challenge. But Paul deals with that in, in the latter part of chapter 13 in Romans and into chapter 14. In fact, what, what you find is he's going he's gonna to make a statement, a bold statement about love, and, and, and then, then he's going to talk to us about that, that the time is short, and he's going to move into this aspect of, of how how judgment gets in the way of our ability to love one another and that how we, how we need to drop that and love in what I call t- to love with a, with a no conditions policy. So if you have your journals with you, um, turn over to, to Romans chapter 13. Um, if you have um, uh, your Bible app with you or something, um, turn over to Romans uh, 13. Just click over there. Down to verse 8 is where we'll pick up the conversation today in the letter. Paul is going to talk about owing 
no one. This idea of owing is a word that, that comes from just our conversation even last week in the previous last verses, uh, seven, uh, 6 and 7, that we talked about, about paying what is owed, uh, owing revenue, pay it, owing uh, tax to pay that respect and honor, pay that as well. But then he says in, in verse 8, owe or be obligated, obligate, owe no one anything except except to love each other. You and I carry a debt to love. And so Paul's standard here is to owe no one anything except to love one another, for, for one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Now, remember, part of his audience are people of a Jewish heritage. They understand the law, and Paul's comment is that you want to fulfill the law. In the back of your mind, you want to fulfill the law. Listen, the way you do that is, is that you love. Love is this fulfillment of the law. For, for the commandments that you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You shall cherish those who are close in proximity to you. You shall cherish them. Love does no wrong. In other words, love does not harm. Love does not harm to a neighbor. Therefore, he's going to state again, verse 8, here in verse 10, therefore love is the fulfillment, love fills of the law. It's the fulfillment, the completion of the law. So what Paul states is, is love is paramount for us as Jesus' followers. And of all the things you try to abide, you try to honor, you try to do, all, just, just simply love. Where it becomes the fulfillment of the law. So as he makes this statement about love, he wants us to know and recognize the day and time in which we live and the shortness of time that we have. Because he says, besides this, besides this, the importance that, that we are to love our neighbor and that love fulfills the law, the fulfillment of the law, besides this, you know, you're acquainted with the time, the time in which we live, the period in which we exist that the hour has come, that the measure of time is now for you to wake up or to rouse from your sleep or your slumber. It's like recognize where we live. Recognize the day and time. For salvation, the process of being saved is now nearer or close to us now than when we first believed or first trusted. The night, which is symbolic of evil, is far gone or far advanced. Evil has far advanced, for the day is at hand. The day is approaching. So then, let us cast off or throw off the works or the deeds of darkness or evil, and let us clothe ourselves with the armor of light, with the weapons of light. Let us walk or live properly or decently as in the daytime, not in orgies or carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality or abandonment, not in quarreling or discord and in jealousy and envy. It's interesting all these are wrapped together because these are self-seeking sins. Sin is always the seeking of self. But put on the Lord Jesus, clothe yourself in him, and make no provision, have no affection for the flesh to gratify its passion. Paul is saying, the day has come that you are to love. And you're to clothe yourself with Christ and not seek the passion of self. To not be self-serving. 
Now, what he does by sets that is kind of the foundation of the conversation for when he moves into chapter 14. That now he's going to talk about our relationship with Christians. Now, what's interesting is when he talks about chapter 14 and being at peace, he talks about this relationship, he's talking about between believers because the context is that the church in Rome is made up of a variety of people. You have people that come from a Jewish background, so they're familiar with the law and the adherence to the law. And so in their mindset, they have this fundamental aspect of life and how they have to adhere to these obligations of these laws and traditions, and specifically traditions that have been established by their heritage. But at the same time, you have people in the church that that have none of that background. They've just encountered Christ. In other words, no one in their family knew about Jesus. Nobody in their family talked about traditions of faith. And now all of a sudden, they're they're, they're rushed into the room of people of like faith, but yet everyone has a little different practice. Their traditions. Just in this room, there are people with a variety of backgrounds. Those backgrounds and those traditions form our biases and our practices. And you know what happens when we find somebody that practices something different than we think they should practice? We judge them. Like, you know, if they're really a Jesus follower, they wouldn't do that. Or, I've heard it, yeah. When they finally grow up, and really learn to love Jesus, they'll act this way or dress this way or do this. Do you realize that's a a form of judgment, condemnation, that we have on others? Paul's going to use two examples, one of diet and one of days, and we'll speak to it as we read through here. Listen to what he says, as for the one who is weak in faith. Now, what you have to realize about the word weak is it doesn't mean that somebody that is lesser in faith. It means somebody that has a limiting faith. In other words, somebody that puts limits in different areas than you may put limits, whether it be diets or days. It's a limiting faith, so they put limits. So as for the one who limits in faith, welcome him. In other words, accept him as a guest and do not quarrel or debate over opinions or thoughts. Now, those, the, the word for opinion literally means stuff that is not, not a theological doctrinal principle, not specifically stated in Scripture. There are lots of churches and lots of places that have practices and traditions and a heritage that were never grounded in Scripture. People just chose to interpret and chase rabbits and draw lines to things and practices that they thought sounded good. That's why we have hundreds and hundreds of different denominations, and we have tens of thousands of churches with no affiliation with denominations. People draw their own lines. And oftentimes, it has nothing to do with the Bible. It just becomes their practice. So one person believes he may eat anything, while the weak or limiting person eats only vegetables. Now, I am not making a statement, and the Bible's not making a statement of whether meat or vegetarian is better for one or the other, all right? So don't go talk, oh, I need to become a vegetarian now, right? But no, I'm not talking about, that's not what Paul's getting at. Here's the difference. You have an issue of meat in Rome that's sacrificed to idols. And so what they would do is somebody that had a limiting faith or limit They would limit out of their diet things that were sacrificed to other gods. So they would choose to eat vegetables. Those that they knew where they came from, the origination, they may not know the origination of the meat and where it came from. And they didn't in their mind want to succumb to that practice of eating meat that potentially had been sacrificed or had come from a house that practiced that. And so when he says here that he talks about let that one person believes he may eat anything while the other person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. And let not the one who abstains pass judgment or condemn as guilty on the one who eats. For God has welcomed him. God has accepted him, both the one who abstains and the one who eats. Who are you 
listen, <laughs> this is powerful, underline it. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? Who are you? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. The idea as we are both servants of Christ. Paul's trying to make sure that they understand that the one who eats and the one who abstains are both servants of Christ. And yet, as Christ followers, we would make distinctions over trivial matters. Now, they may not be trivial to us at the moment because it's tied to heritage, it's tied to practices, it's tied to traditions. And so we validate the bias, but that's what we find here. Now, in verse 5, he moves from diet to days. He says, one person esteems or values one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. The idea is, is you're going to have people that came from a Jewish background that is going, they're going to be very particular about the Sabbath. You have people that didn't grow up that way, didn't have that background, Gentiles that, that don't have that practice, and so they don't hold to the same standard of the days, yet they value every day is sacred, every day is special, whereas some may value one day over another. Each one, the latter part of verse 5, should be fully convinced or assured in his own mind, in his own thinking, that the one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord, and the one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while he, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. Listen, for none of us lives to himself. Do you realize that the world doesn't revolve around you? You're not the most important person in the room. I'm not the most important person in the room. My rights are not the most important rights in the room. And what's funny is we live in a day and time where individualism and the rise and where this has transitioned through all kinds, I mean, we could go into a whole conversation about individualism. But individualism leads to this idea of condemnation and offensiveness. They may say that it's separation and to each his own, but individualism says my individual rights are more important than your rights, and therefore I am more important than you, and that you need to succumb to what I, what I practice. And so what Paul is saying here, for none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's collectively. For to this end, Christ died and lived again that we might be Lord, that, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. So here's the question. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? On that fellow believer? Or you, why do you despise your brother? The word for despise means to reject. Why do you reject him? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us will give an account of himself to God, who is our judge. So what Paul delineates here is that there are traditions, there are practices that find no basis in Scripture. And yet we've adhered to them, we've adopted them, we've included them. And we judge our allegiances and our alliances, we judge our brothers and sisters, we judge those in which we engage with based upon their practices or based upon their adherence. I'll give you an example. Do you know what, the, the one thing that divided the church more than anything else in 2020 and 2021 
had nothing to do with theology, had nothing to do with doctrine. It was the mask. And do you realize, and you, you've done this, haven't you? You've walked into a place and seen somebody didn't have their mask or somebody that was wearing their mask. And you placed a judgment. Look at people a second way in church, not in church. Did they wear it? Did they not? What about vaccination? Which one did they get? Did they get the right one? Did they get the one one? Did they get the two one? You know? Are they getting the third one? You know? On and on it goes. And we make, we make judgments on people based upon our perception of what should be. That has no biblical mandate. It's about tradition. It's about practice. This ought not to be. This ought not to be. And so what we read is how we handle that. How do we relate to one another in these moments? He says, therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer. No more. But rather decide or conclude never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of the brother. I know, I know, Paul says, and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus Christ that nothing is unclean in itself. But if it is unclean for someone who thinks it, un who, for, if it is unclean for, I will say it's right, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it unclean. The idea was, I know that no food is unclean, but if it is unclean to someone, then it is unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one from whom Christ died. Freedoms. Traditions, lines, whether it's a limiting faith or a more freedom-based faith. The idea would be that I would invite you over to my house to have dinner, and I feel like steak tonight, but I know that you're a vegetarian, and I've got a few vegetables around for you. And so because it's my house and it's my right, I'm going to go ahead and eat my steak in front of you, get over it, grow up, and get saved, right? Right? But you eat your vegetables. What I've done in that meantime is I've created a very challenging moment for my brother in Christ. Not only am I putting them in a position of making a choice, maybe they choose to eat meat, but they know meat's wrong, but because of peer pressure, they decide to do it. And what they thought was wrong for them, they do. But he talks about that in just a minute. There's a whole other issue about sin. See, I need to be cognizant of that. I may know it's unclean, it may be for me, but for them, that, that they, they have a limiting faith, and so they decide to limit those things. I need to encourage that. I need to support that. So it's about how I respond to them and how I care for them. I, I don't want anything that I do to be this stumbling block. So do not let what you regard as good to be spoken of as evil, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Underline that passage because it's so important to understand. The word righteousness means justice. The word peace means harmony. The joy is this gladness in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then, let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Hebrews 24, go read it, great passage. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have Keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts, whoever has doubts, 
is condemned if he eats because he is e his eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. When in doubt, don't. What you believe, live. But I can't get away from what Paul tries to get across to us. Maybe the most important part of the lesson is that we are to do four things. To love, to act justly, to know peace, and to know joy in the Holy Spirit. Love means that I care for the welfare of everyone that I know. The ones that are easy, the ones that are I struggle with knowing how, and the ones that are difficult. I'm called to love, to build up, to edify, to value, to cherish. But then to act righteous, this idea of justice, this hijacked word. Justice simply means to do what is right. I need to do what's right. To seek the peace and the joy in the Holy Spirit, harmony. There used to be, we lived in Florida and Wachula, going between Wachula and Winter Haven, there was a... Um, there were two churches along the way. One was called Unity Baptist Church, another one called Harmony Baptist Church. I said they both split and started new churches. But, you know, it was just one of these, you, you, first of all, it's hard to find unity and harmony in a Baptist church anywhere, but, but in the sense of how important that is, harmony is the work of the Spirit in us. It's peace and joy, this gladness in who God is and what He's doing. We have a responsibility to each other. And I don't think until we get it right as believers that we have a really valid message to speak to people outside until we learn to love one another. Man, I'm just, I'm watching things implode spiritually in Christian, in the Christian world, even in our denomination. Because people have forgotten how to love. About my right and this right. But where's the love? Where's doing the right thing? Sometimes the right thing isn't my right. Sometimes doing the right thing is abandoning my right and walking along someone else. It's about harmony. It's about joy. Let's love. Let's love with a love that consumes. Will you pray with me? Father, I recognize that what Paul talks about is challenging. Sometimes you go too far in one direction and you can find yourself in trouble. And yet, he recognizes that there is division and people are drawing lines about faith and sincerity of faith and validity of faith based upon human traditions or practices. Father, may our faith need not be about human tradition. May our faith be about a consuming love for Jesus, the clothing ourselves in Christ and abandoning ourselves to you, pursuing you. And Lord, may we love well the people that are easy to love. May we, may we love well those that we struggle to know how to love. Help us to love well. And even those that are, are difficult at times to love, that, that we, would, we would demonstrate the love that you had for us, being ambassadors of that love for your glory, for your honor. Jesus, we love you, for it's in your name we pray.